Violence and Erupters have one goal in mind every day, stop killings. They're not trying to dismantle gangs. What they're trying to do is save a life. Interrupting Violence. Next on Black Nouveau. Hello and welcome to this edition of Black Nouveau. I'm Milton Dockery. And I'm Faith Colas. We're glad you could join us. This week, we'll profile the Greenwood Park Gallery and meet the head of the Zoological Society of Milwaukee. We'll continue our dialogue with MPS Superintendent Dr. Gregory Thornton and give you a chance to win tickets to see from my hometown at the Milwaukee Rep. First, the Milwaukee Film Festival begins this week and is offering a number of films that speak to urban and multicultural interests from Milwaukee Striders Track Club to a youth poetry slam. One of the main attractions is The Interrupters, a documentary about a Chicago community group's effort to curb urban violence. The film is considered a front runner for the 2012 Best Documentary Oscar. Police in Chicago charged three teenagers with first degree murder today. Darian Albert was attacked as he walked home from school. Damn. I seen the video and it just hit me like a ton of bricks. The first thing that I said was, oh man, I hope his mother does not see this. And I look at my sisters and my brothers today, that was once me. This is unacceptable for me to be holding this young man's obituary. Let this be a wake up call, let this be a stop call. And we are joined now by Jonathan Jackson, artistic and executive director of the festival. Welcome Jonathan. Hi, thank you for having me. Tell me about The Interrupters. Uh, the Interrupters is one of our spotlight films in the Milwaukee Film Festival this year. And uh, I really think it's going to be a Best Documentary Oscar favorite this year. It is a film that profiles a group in Chicago. The group is called Ceasefire. They are a group of literally violence interrupters. They work on the streets in Chicago. And the documentary profiles them as they work uh, to literally interrupt violence in the streets and then mediate with the groups afterwards, after the um, actual uh, you know, violence erupts, their process doesn't stop there. And the interrupters themselves are, are fascinating figures because the interrupters are former gang members, uh, former convicts themselves. And they actually, you know, they have now you know, rehabilitated themselves and are working to, to better the streets of Chicago. What happens on September 24th here in Milwaukee? Uh, well, we're delighted that Steve James, the director of the film, who was also the director of the film um, Hoop Dreams, a very famous film, profiles, you know, even a, a Marquette basketball athlete in that film, will be here along with the subjects of the film, uh, Amina, Cole, and Eddie. Three of these violence interrupters are going to be here uh, in Milwaukee on the 24th to do a uh, talk back, an extended talk back to the film afterwards. And we're just really excited about that uh, experience at the Oriental Theater on the 24th. So with this film, there's some other activities surround it um, about the film. And there's a community um, dialogue that's going to take place Absolutely. on September 26th. Talk a little bit about that. Um, we're still, uh, we're, we're just really excited about using this film to talk you know, about Milwaukee's violence prevention community and the people doing great work in that area in Milwaukee. And so we're working with uh, Mike Goucher, um, with Channel 12 and with the Marquette University Law School to do a, a special series of his program on the issues. And on Monday the 26th at Marquette, we're going to do a special panel looking at and profiling uh, a, a couple of different individuals leading this um, movement in Milwaukee. And the discussion will be joined by Police Chief Ed Flynn, uh, Ron Johnson of the Restorative Justice Movement, Barbara Notstein of uh, Safe and Sound, uh, and Judge Joe Donald of the Family Court, all people who have worked in this, you know, for years. And so we're just excited to sort of create a community forum and dialogue uh, around this film and around the powerful work that we're going to see on screen and sort of bring it back home to Milwaukee and, and you know what we might learn from this experience. So with the interrupters there's some other films of course that are going to be taking place at the festival that Absolutely. people will want to get a ticket for and one of them is Pass the Baton. Talk mm -hmm. a little bit about Pass the Baton. 
Uh, well, uh, Pass the Baton is a documentary that was actually uh, produced and, and came out of the UWM film department in Milwaukee, an incredible filmmaking program in Milwaukee. And Pass the Baton profiles the Milwaukee Striders or the Joe Sims Milwaukee Striders. And it's a summer track program that works with youth, youth of, of all ages, and it profiles sort of their journey as they go to the sort of national uh, trials to try and compete. And it sort of profiles the parents and the people behind this Milwaukee Striders group that, you know, are, are presenting, providing an incredible outlet for youth to, uh, you know, do some athletic activities when, you know, they might be doing something else with their time. Is that a big goal of the festival to have um, some films that are produced and about Milwaukee here in Milwaukee at the festival? Uh, absolutely. We have a, a great filmmaking community here in Milwaukee uh, that we're really proud of and, and we love to spotlight the work of uh, the Milwaukee filmmaking community. Every year we screen several films um, uh, about you know the community in Milwaukee. Um, last year we featured the work of uh, Brad Pruitt um, in the festival with a, a film, Mark My Words, about poetry slams. And, you know, it's exciting. We actually have a film from outside of Milwaukee this year, but features and profiles a, a, a poetry slam competition in Chicago called Louder Than a Bomb. Okay, and that's, that was leading into my next question because I understand you're doing some outreach with Louder Than a Bomb. Yeah, we, um, there's a couple of different things that we're doing. One is that, you know, we're having the big public screenings of Louder Than a Bomb, and we're excited because uh, the director is going to be here, John Siskel. One of the Poetry Slam groups is going to be here. Um, and so, like, after the screening, when you've been riveted by them on screen as part of this Poetry Slam competition, they're going to, you know, do some poetry on stage there at the Oriental. But then also one of the things we do with the festival is we like to use the power of film, you know, for, for educational goals. And we're doing uh, a series of school group screenings at the festival. And on Friday, um, we're going to do a screening in the morning at the Oriental Theater with over a thousand kids, students from, from MPS, from different schools in Milwaukee, to see this uh, uh, film about Poetry Slam and you know to to sort of learn about this experience and how people can use you know poetry as a powerful force in their lives. So I want to get my ticket. Everyone watching wants to get the ticket. Where can <laughs> they get tickets? Everything is on the website. It's the absolute best place to go. That's mkefilm.org, um, and that's the the non that's the best place go to spot for for all your film information. mkefilm.org, and we also have trailers for all the films on the website. Thank you, Jonathan. Absolutely. You can get more information on the variety of films being offered from the Black Nouveau website, which will also have a link to the Milwaukee Film Festival website. If you are thinking about buying art or getting something framed, then Greenwood Park Gallery and Framing is for you. That's a business you don't usually see in the African American community. Liddy Collins has more. It's an art itself, like, like, like sewing a dress and cutting out the pieces and putting the pieces together. An artist, you know, taking the canvas and, and painting certain pieces of it. Well, framing is an art and a skill also. That's what we are, is framers. And the art gallery, art goes with framing. Framing goes with art. So we built the art gallery uh, to support the framing part of it. Each one supports each other. Meet Fred Robinson, owner and founder of the Greenwood Park Gallery and Framing on Milwaukee's Northwest Side. Along with his son Fred Jr. and Billy Joyce Nash, this team built a gallery and framing business, a business that was developed over time. They did it in stages. First they learned the business, then brought the equipment, and then set up a gallery for the customers. The art came first, then the framing, with framing being the base for the art gallery. Why an art gallery as opposed to any other venture? I kind of tumbled in this by, by an accident down in Indianapolis when, uh, when I, I seen a guy, he was just selling pictures as fast as he could hand them to customers, and I said, I can do that. But as um, going along, and doing a little research, it didn't take me long to realize that 
we should be in the framing business. Um, it took about 10 minutes of really thinking about it. You know, what you got to have a frame. So there's uh, a lot of people that have rolled up art in a closet. And the reason why it's rolled up is because they can't afford to uh, have it framed. So what we specialize in is affordable framing. We buy a lot of our material in bulk and uh, try to give uh, nice art, decent framing. What type of art does your gallery carry? We have a lot of uh, contemporary black American art and we have art, we try to have a selection of art for everybody. We have uh, florals, we have scenery. We have a mix, a diverse mix of art. Mainly, it's mostly uh, black American art. And we, we're in a black American area. With business picking up, their sales and marketing person is getting trained in the main operation of the business. You're learning the framing business. What kind of training are you going through? Um, I go into uh, training um, in uh, Las Vegas, workshops there. Um, also, one of our vendors, Omega, I've been to some training there, and Fred has been training me here. The learning of this business is a never-ending process, and just as there are designers of clothes, there are designers who design patterns and colors for frames. You have to have good equipment, and you have to keep your nose to the grindstone and uh, listen, learn, and we go to seminars on a continual basis to learn to trade. And there are so many different levels of framing. You know, there are archival. Besides archiving, they do preservation. You might have a particular uh, piece that's um, a more of a, a higher quality piece. Um, then what you would have to do is um, use a different type of material to, um, so that piece can, can sustain its value. Um, for instance, acid-free mat board, acid-free foam core. Um, you might have glare-free glare glass. Um, and it, it just the materials that, that would be used to frame that piece um, would, would, call, it would call for that particular type of material more of a better quality of material. If someone brings a piece in that they don't know what it is, we, we do research on the art. Pacing themselves while serving their customers is one of their challenges. It's not just buying a picture, it's the business aspect of it. We're exploring getting into even the printing. You know, an artist come in and he has a nice picture and he wants to have that picture distributed. Uh, we can, we're, we're looking at getting into the printing on canvas. It even needs a small run, uh, say 25, addition of 25, or, or maybe even 50. The Greenwood Park Gallery and Framing want people to know the different types of art that's available and how art can enrich their homes. When you want your home to be beautiful, you want accent pieces, artists, is one of those things. Uh, we want them to know, uh, to have an appreciation for art. That's why this gallery is open, so people can appreciate all the different types of art that is out there, but specifically um, African-American art, African-American artists, limited edition prints or small print or something that you just think is beautiful and that it will be framed in a way that it will just make you feel good. And we're joined again by MPS Superintendent, Dr. Gregory Thornton. Dr. Thornton, welcome back, sir. It's good to be back. Dr. Thornton, last week we had a discussion on how the community has responded to your budget situation. Yes. Can you talk about some of the partnerships that you've developed as a result of that? I spoke last week about the parents, but let me tell you a little bit about the corporate community of Milwaukee. Uh, I hope you noticed uh, we just received one of the largest awards ever given by GE. 
in, in K-12 education, the largest for like MPS, uh, $20 million grant to, for us to advance science and mathematics, significant. I'm pleased to say that that response has, has yielded from $33 million in grant dollars a year ago to close to $90 million this year. So that says to me the community's invested, in, and it's a good investment. The return is going to be great for them. Uh, as I begin to move through the community and have conversations not only with the corporate community but as well as the faith-based community, we are very excited that hopefully next year if you have me back or next month that you have me back, I'll be able to make a really, really great big announcement that we're going to be named one of the 10 school districts in America that's going to be part of a, a, a U.S. faith-based initiative. So the response has been tremendous. Uh, you know, there is certainly a major investment to be made in MPS. MPS is truly the economic engine for this city, and, and certainly I'm seeing a, a really great response, at least from the corporate side. Now, Doc, I'm going to hold you to that now. Bring you back for that big announcement now. Bring it back for a big announcement. All righty. Now, before we move more into budget issues, sure. getting back to the academic question, you are a tremendous supporter of standardization. I am. Not only for MPS, yes. but any school that gets public funding. Correct. Talk about that. I believe what's good for the best is good for the rest. And in standardization, we have a responsibility to our to our citizens. We have a responsibility to our to our taxpayers to ensure that the dollars that are, are appropriated here in Milwaukee are, are we have strong accountability measures around them, and that we basically hold everyone accountable. This year alone, I actually closed ten schools mm -hmm. because those schools were not making the grade, and that's accountability. This year coming up, I will probably close another ten schools. It's accountability, and I believe that that accountability should actually be part of everyone in the city of Milwaukee that receives uh, uh, certainly um, funds from, from taxpayers. That's a tough decision. Yes. Closing 10 schools. It was. And in the future can maybe close 10 more. It was. Does it get much pushback or much support on that? I, 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 the, the, put, the support certainly came from our board. I mean, and the pushback came from our community. No one wants their schools closed. Their schools are institutions. That's where many families have gone for a number of years. Mom's gone there. Grandmom's gone there. But at the end of the day, you know, I think parents want the best for their children. And it's my goal to get young people into the best place that they can get a quality education. Let's get into some financial planning. Sure. What are some, some specifics, excuse me, long-range financial planning that you are doing? Well, right now, my big financial plan is around facilities. As you well know, our, our student population does not match our, our building capacity. I actually commission a facilities master plan, which actually comes due in November. And that plan will talk to us a little bit about the schools that probably need to close that are no longer cost effective to keep open. And I'm, of, I'm very hopeful that good stewardship of those, of those programs will allow us to make some mid-course corrections to get the district right size. But not only that, Doc, you've done some other impressive things that's quite interesting. You were able to bring back some of the teachers that had been laid off. Well, How did you do that, Brent? Well, when I first came in, uh, there were about 400 teachers mm -hmm. laid off, and we are very fortunate to bring about 400 mm -hmm. back. Uh, and that was merely around re-engineering some of our budget appropriations. And most recently, uh, we were able to bring 70 teachers back. Uh, unfortunately, you know, the big driver in our budget is, is personnel. It okay. makes up a significant portion of it. And that's the hardest part for me to do, to lay folks off. And this year, I'm a 1,000 less employees. Okay. This time uh, a year ago, I had 1,000 more employees. This year, I have 1,000 less, which resulted in about 500 layoffs. I'm really pleased to say that we're constantly scrubbing the budget, trying to figure out ways to get teachers in classrooms, because at the end of the day, the teacher is the most important thing for a young person. And, and I know the magic that happens when you have a masterful teacher. So I'm committed to trying to get those folks back in the classrooms as soon as I can get them back there. About two and a half minutes, two more questions. Okay. Getting back to the academic question, what are you doing to close that achievement gap? One, I've, I've acknowledged it. I mean, you, you, certainly you never move a gap if you pretend it doesn't exist. It exists. It's significant. It's big here. It's one of the largest in the country. So one of the things we've done very strategically is one, the new reading series, is to create opportunities and access for all children to be part of a, a rich, vibrant curriculum. The movement we're getting ready to do in science and mathematics, we're going to basically standardize mathematics. We're going to certainly push for young people to begin to get algebra at the eighth grade. We know that math and algebra is the gatekeeper for higher education. And at the same time, we're, we're going to launch two college access centers. Very exciting. The formal announcement will be made here. We're going to launch two college access centers to give youngsters opportunity and access to actually begin to make the journey into college. So we got a number of things. But the most important thing, I would say, is around teacher training and beginning to give our teachers the tools that are necessary to differentiate. Now, you learn a little quicker than I do. I understand. 
But I can learn, too, if you differentiate the approach and give me a little additional time. And we're, get, we're equipping our teachers with those skills necessary to do that. But, Doc, what about this, though? You mentioned earlier about empowering students. As a result, the dropout rate has declined. Yeah. Do you think also by empowering these young people that it will help close that achievement gap? I'm going to make them take responsibility for their own learning. And we haven't done that in, in many years. So it's not uncommon to go through one of our buildings and see teachers sitting down with their students talking about, let me tell you where you're at. Let me tell you what you where you got to go. And more important, let me tell you what you have to do to get there. This learning thing is a triangle. It's, it's certainly the home. It's the school and it's the student. When all three of those things are working together, oh, what a beautiful uh, song that they make. And that's what we're trying to do. I have about 45 seconds. You I got want it. to talk about a big elephant in the room now. Okay. Talk about efforts to keep more students in school and lessening the dropout rate, in essence, retention. Well, one, we got to stop pushing them out. If, if you stop pushing them out, you're going to keep. Cons make that clear. What do you mean? What I'm suggesting to you that there are places in Milwaukee and throughout the country we push kids out. Okay. You got to create an environment that's inviting. You got to look for ways to bring youngsters in. You got to have meaningful opportunities for youngsters to be part of. And what we're doing now is looking at transition programs to go get these young people who made these mistakes and bringing them back. Dr. Gregory Thorne, thank you for joining us, sir. It's always a pleasure. During the year, Milwaukee Public Television and its community partners will be doing a number of programs around the issue of dropouts. So stay tuned. The Milwaukee County Zoo is one of the finest in the country with over 2,500 animals representing over 300 species. This week, we're going back into the Black Nouveau archives to reprise the profile of the president and CEO of the Milwaukee Zoological Society, Dr. Robert Burt Davis. Whoa, if I could talk to the animals just imagine it, chatting with a chimp and chimpanzee. Imagine talking to a tiger, chatting with a cheetah. What a neat achievement it would be. If we could talk to the animals and learn their languages, maybe take an animal degree. I'd study elephant and eagle. I grew up on the south side of Chicago, near a park called Jackson Park. And that park had a golf course. And it also had a playground. And at the age of maybe six or seven, of course, my parents prevented me from leaving the block, as most kids were prevented. But I would wander off with a friend of mine, and we would go over to the park, and I would tr jump over into the uh, golf course. And I had a favorite pond, and this pond had turtles and frogs. And I can remember that as being my first true experience with nature, and that was the catalyst for me becoming interested in animals and eventually becoming a veterinarian and working in a zoo. An ambassador says, this is important. So saving animals and plants so that they do not become endangered species is important. And when you're an ambassador, you say, this is important to me, and this should be important to you. Dr. Burt believes it's, it's important so to touch to young lives early. One of the fastest growing programs that we have here at the Zoological Society and our conservation education program are programs for our two and three year olds, which usually involves a parent or a guardian. And I think this is a very important one because it involves what we call intergenerational learning. And that's the parents or the guardians are actually learning with the students themselves. And at that age, at that tender age, they still have this real strong commitment to animals. And so animals serve primarily as our ambassadors to any kind of subject matter, whether it's science, or with its nature or the environment. These animals are the critical key component as ambassadors in, in, in the story that we talk about and creating the experience that we talk about. And so we initially talk about just our, our love for these animals and why they are really important to us just through, 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 through curious kind of conversations about why they're important. And so that kind of sets the tone, that sets the foundation for this value initiative. I've been blessed, actually. I've been very fortunate in being able to travel, not only for business, but as part of the, under the umbrella of business, to share um, some of my experiences and sell some of my knowledge about conservation, about zoos and aquariums, and about careers. I typically spend, oh, maybe two or three visits a year just specifically recruiting young students of all colors into the profession of veterinary medicine and then more specifically trying to challenge them to think about careers in working in zoos and aquariums. It's been interesting because one of the things that I've noticed, and it doesn't matter if I travel in suburbs or 
urban areas or in rural areas, all kids are connected to nature. And I think that's one of the more powerful things about what we do as a cultural institution, because zoos are, and aquariums are cultural institutions, but we have a connection to animals and to nature that no other place can give you. No brewer's game, not to fault the brewers, no art museum, no public museum, um, no science center even can do what zoos and aquariums do, because we have this innate uh, connection, natural connection to nature, and, and, and zoos and aquariums have a powerful responsibility in kind of brokering that relationship. And so what I do when I talk to children of all ages is I go back to the basics about what interests you about nature. What is it about you that you find so fascinating with nature? And then I turn that into kind of a curiosity, and then I talk about the importance that we all have in terms of our role and saving nature and saving animals and saving this endangered habitat environment that we have. And so it's kind of one of those full circle conversations, regardless of whether it's at a cocktail party or in a classroom, talking really about the value of nature and why we need to be active participants in making sure that we save it, because this is the only earth that we have and we're not going to get another one. If I could walk with the animals and talk with the animals, grunt, squeak, squawk with the animals, Squeak and squawk and speak and talk to me. Oh, I know you're talking about the Isley brothers. Who's that lady? Who's that lady? Such a lady. Who's that lady? Beautiful lady. Who's that lady? Real fine lady. Who's that lady? This is your last chance to win a pair of tickets to see from my hometown. Playing at the Milwaukee Rep through October 30th. All you have to do is correctly answer the following question. Milwaukee and Al Jarreau won his first American Grammy Award for what album? If you think you know the answer, call 414-297-7556 or email us at tvviewer at M-A-T-C dot edu. Give us your name, your phone number, and the answer to the Black Nouveau question. We'll pick four winners from the correct entries. If you've won tickets from us in either of the last two contests, you're not eligible to win this time around, and you've got until September 25th to enter. And that wraps up this edition of Black Nouveau. Remember in the coming week, do something to expand your world. Good night. Good night, be safe, and thanks for watching.